platters, the trays, the glasses, and I save a fortune on everything. <laughs> For entertaining, there's no place like Ross. Good morning, America. New overnight election interference. The new report saying the intelligence community has concluded that Russia intervened in the presidential election. Did Russian hacking help Donald Trump win? His transition team responding this morning. Winter whiteout, two feet in spots so far, driving treacherous, cars sliding off the highway, others buried and abandoned. Man, this is crazy. Plus, brutal wind chills making things even worse. The watches, warnings, and advisories you need to hear. Chilling confession. The accused church shooter Dylan Roof's videotaped statement to police played in court, laughing as he describes the killings of nine people in a historic Charleston church. Did you shoot him? Yes. What kind of gun did you use? <laughs> a Glock 45. Why he says he opened fire. From phone to paperweight, Samsung's plan for its unreturned Galaxy Note 7 phones after reports some of them burst into flames. They've been recalled. They're dangerous. How Samsung's flicking the kill switch. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Hey, good morning. Let's get straight to our top story. Donald Trump overnight in snowy Grand Rapids, Michigan. His first visit on his ongoing thank you tour to one of the so-called blue wall states that delivered his campaign that surprise victory in November. This morning, the president-elect's transition team finding itself in a war of words with America's intelligence agencies. Now, these agencies, according to two new published reports, have concluded that Russia was deliberately working to sway the election towards Trump through its hacking. We've got team coverage of the story this morning. We're going to start with ABC's Mary Bruce, who's right there at the White House. Mary, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, for months, the U.S. government has suspected that Russia intentionally interfered with the U.S. presidential election, intentionally hacking into emails from the DNC and those close to Hillary Clinton. But this morning, intelligence agencies have reportedly concluded that Russia intended to do far more than just meddle. This morning, the Washington Post reporting that a secret CIA report found Russia interfered in the U.S. election to help Donald Trump win the White House. Individuals connected to the Russian government reportedly provided WikiLeaks with hacked emails as part of a wider Russian operation to boost Trump and hurt Clinton's chances. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. And the New York Times reporting intelligence agencies found Russia also hacked the RNC, but did not release whatever information they gleaned from the Republican network. Overnight, Trump's transition team was swift to respond, questioning the credibility of the CIA. In a statement saying, these are the same people that said Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Intelligence agencies ultimately concluded that Russia was behind the hacking, but Trump has repeatedly shrugged it off. I mean, it could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, okay? You don't know who broke in to DNC. U.S. intelligence agencies believe the Russians are behind that leak. Why don't you believe it? Uh, I don't know if they're behind it, and I think it's uh, public relations, frankly. Negotiating relations with Russia will be a challenge for Trump's next secretary of state. Rudy Giuliani, once a top contender, has taken himself out of the running. I saw that he had so many good candidates available. I mean, there was no reason to complicate his life any longer. In a statement, Trump said Giuliani is and continues to be a close personal friend. Mitt Romney and ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson are still among the contenders for Secretary of State. But Giuliani's making clear he thinks Romney should be off that list. My advice would be Mitt went just a little too far uh, to, you can, you, you can make friends and make up, but I don't I would not see him as a candidate for the cabinet. And this morning, Trump is already tweeting, praising Giuliani as one of the finest people he knows. Now, here at the White House, there's no comment this morning on Russia's involvement in the election. But President Obama's made clear he wants to get to the bottom of this. He's already ordered a full review of the hacking, says he wants a report before he leaves office next month.
Dan and Paula. All right, Mary, so many questions for that. We want to bring in two of our ABC News contributors. We've got Colonel Stephen Ganyard, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State who's in Washington. Also with us, political analyst Matthew Dowd, who is in Austin, Texas. Okay, guys, where do we begin? But let's begin with these intelligence reports. Steve, let's start with you. What do you make of these reports that Russia was specifically trying to help Trump? Is this conclusion credible? Paula, I think uh, there's really nothing new in this report that we're seeing. Uh, much of this was put out by the DNI back in October. What is new is that apparently the intelligence community has come to some conclusion here that the Russians were favoring Mr. Trump. So I don't think that there's any doubt that the Russians interfered with U.S. democracy. Uh, but the real question is, what did it do and how did it influence the outcome of the election? Matt, what's your take on Trump's response here? He, <clears throat> he said uh, these are the same people that, Saddam, that said Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, d does he have a point here? Well, it's an amazing response from not only an American, but from an American who's president-elect. He's basically attacking the CIA in order to defend Vladimir Putin and Russia in this. And keep in mind that Russia has been a rival of ours nearly as long as the Army-Navy game in this. But for a sitting president-elect to attack our, a U.S. agency to defend Russia is quite an amazing situation. So, Steve, if it's true that the Russians deliberately intervened in this way, what really can the U.S. do about it? Well, the, in some ways, Paul, the horse is out of the barn. Uh, but there are things that they can do. They can go back and, and using cyber forensics, they can determine if there were particular individuals involved. I think in the past we've seen where the U.S. has actually indicted Ch Chinese hackers by name uh, who have been stealing uh, uh, IP from the, from the United States. So they can do this sort of name and shame. The U.S. also has very sophisticated capabilities in terms of offensive cyber hacking. Uh, but that's a big Pandora's box that gets opened. And so uh, apparently the, the, Clinton, or the uh, Obama administration knew about this uh, a few months ago and has yet to do anything about it. So the real question is, what does the commander in chief think about this now? This is really on his watch. It's a huge Pandora's box because if you counterattack, there will be response and then you're going to have to respond to the responses, and it can spiral out of control very quickly. Matt, though, let me, let me switch subjects just for a second here. While we have you, let's talk about this news that Rudy Giuliani is out of the running for Secretary of State. As Mary Bruce mentioned a, a minute ago, uh, Trump is tweeting about it this morning, saying Giuliani is one of the finest people I know, uh, end quote. So, so who's left in the hunt for this job now? Well, it, it reminds me a little bit of a, of a Seinfeld episode with George Costanza saying, wait, you can't break up with me, I'm breaking up with you. I think Donald Trump broke up with Rudy Giuliani long before Rudy Giuliani said, take me out of this. You could, we've seen that in the reports over the last few, uh, few weeks in this. I think it leaves only a few candidates. I, the reports are that Mitt Romney has fallen way down, and I think if you were going to do Mitt Romney, you were going to do them him weeks ago. It looks like it's settling on probably somebody like Rex Tillerson, the chairman or former head of Exxon, which is interesting since the beginning of this conversation, he has a very close relationship with Russia and Vladimir Putin as well. So another complicating factor in this. Uh, one last question to touch on. You know, we, we learned this week that Trump's going to stay on as executive producer of Celebrity Apprentice, but Newt Gingrich is now even saying that that's a weird decision. But Trump tweeting this morning, quote, I have nothing to do with The Apprentice except for the fact that I conceived it with Mark B., Mark Burnett, and have a big stake in it. I will devote zero time. Matt, is this issue likely to dog him? Yes, this issue and many. I think, Paula, as we've talked and you, me, you and Dan have talked, I don't think the policies are ultimately going to be problematic for Donald Trump. I think it's the con potential conflicts of interest that continue to surround Donald Trump. And this is another one. He is going to get a monthly check from NBC and The Apprentice while he is president of the United States. That's going to present a series of issues that he's going to have to deal with in the course of his presidency. Matthew Dowd and Colonel Steve Ganyard, our thanks to both of you this morning. We are going to move on now to the other big story this morning. That's the heavy snow hitting several states from Michigan to New York as a big blast of cold air sweeps across much of this country. So let's get it out to Rob Marciano, who's in New York's Central Park with the unenviable duty of being outside this morning. <laughs> hey, Rob, good morning. <laughs> 
Good morning, Dan. Hi, Paul. A cool, crisp 29 degrees. Feels like 21 with the wind chill, but compared to this fall, it's really a slap in the face and a large chunk of the country getting a piece of this Arctic air. Look at all the alerts, the watches, the warnings, the advisories, especially across the northern tier from snow to frost to uh, freezing rain out to the Pacific Northwest. So the big story continues to be the cold air. Look at the wind chills this morning. That Arctic air diving all the way down to the south. 21 degrees is what it feels like in Atlanta as well. Nine in Chicago. And we've got even more cold air that's building up across the Arctic that will be diving down next week. So if you think this is cold, wait till next Wednesday or Thursday. Of course, with all this cold air going across the relatively warm waters of the Great Lakes, that is big time lake effect snow for Grand Rapids, Cleveland and Buffalo and Jamestown, New York, which is where we find ABC's Adrian Bankart this morning. Good morning, Adrian. Good morning to you, Rob. You know exactly what this is like standing out here in the snow. And we've got to tell you, as you mentioned, heavy snow across the Great Lakes. It's also been snowing very heavily here in Jamestown, making for treacherous conditions. Visibility is reduced at times to just half a mile, making for a long, messy and at times dangerous ride. Overnight, heavy lake effect snow pounding parts of New York, Ohio and Michigan. There's a lot of snow and it's still snowing. Look at this. In Chautauqua County, New York, 22 inches of snow already on the ground. Up to two feet of snow expected to fall throughout the Great Lakes region. Man, this is crazy. In Cleveland, parking lots filled with abandoned cars. This is a mess. I'm out here getting my abominable snowman on. Cars sliding off Interstate 90 in New York as plows work to clear the snow. We caught up with big rig driver Bob West, who was struggling with the conditions. I've never put one in the ditch yet, so uh, I feel pretty confident in my ability to drive in this, but it's the people around me that scare me. In Perrysburg, New York, homeowners trying to clear out. I don't wait for it to get too deep because you won't be able to do anything with it. The snow coming down at a rate of two inches per hour, and it's not over yet. I like the snow, or I would probably have moved. There's nothing wrong with this. This is heaven, so how, how can you beat it? Yeah, heaven at 20 degrees with a wind chill in the teens. And again, this is just the first major snowstorm of the season, so we better get ready for more. Dan? Uh, I hate to hear that. Uh, thank you, Adrian and Rob. Uh, we appreciate it. We do want to move now, though, to the breaking news this morning in the fight against ISIS. America's Secretary of State Ash Carter announcing that more American troops are heading over to Syria. ABC's Lama Hassan is on that story from our London Bureau. Lama, good morning to you. And good morning to you, Dan. Well, this morning, Defense Secretary Ash Carter announcing that 200 additional U.S. forces will be heading to Syria. The troops will include special forces trainers, advisors, and bomb disposal units to help the coalition of Kurdish and Arab forces fighting ISIS and recapture its stronghold of Raqqa. The troops will join the other 300 U.S. special forces already on the ground in Syria. The announcement coming as the coalition carries out its largest airstrike to date, pounding and destroying 168 tanker trunks near the ancient city of Palmyra, all belonging to ISIS, cutting off their supply. Meanwhile, the battle for Syria's largest city, Aleppo, is almost over, with Syrian government forces backed by Russia claiming they now control more than 90 percent of the city. Residents fleeing the fighting, streaming out on foot, more than 8,000 leaving since Friday, just days after ABC News tracked the return to the city, with images showing buildings leveled and streets destroyed. Paula? Yeah, those images, tough to see. Lama, thank you. We want to move now to the dramatic moments in the courtroom as Dylan Roof's chilling and disturbing confession to killing nine people inside a South Carolina church is played for the jury. At times, Roof was laughing during his confession, and ABC's Steve Osinsami has more. For the first time, we hear this accused racist and mass murderer try and explain himself this morning. I was sitting there and I was like, you know, just thinking about whether I should do it or not. In his disturbing video confession recorded by agents from the FBI, 22-year-old Dylan Roof acts as if he's talking about a night out on the town. Did you shoot him? Yes. What kind of gun did you use? <laughs> a Glock 45. In surveillance videos played in court from outside this historic black church in June of 2015, we see the faces of the nine parishioners Roof is accused of killing. These are their last moments alive. 87-year-old Susie Jackson, Cynthia Hurd, and Reverend Pinckney. He left behind these two little girls. Why did you have to do it? Well, I had to do it because 
somebody had to do something because you know black people are killing white people every day. He says he bought the gun, seen here, after his 21st birthday. How many times did you reload? All the times. When I shot a magazine, it's like I just went, bah, 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 bah. you see what I'm saying? At times, he laughed, telling the story. He calls himself a white nationalist and says that the Trayvon Martin case in Florida woke him up. For Good Morning America, Steve Osinsami, ABC News, Atlanta. Steve, thank you. Just horrifying to listen to and to watch, especially to see those victims in their final moments. Mm -hmm. We have to switch gears yet again now. We're going to talk about the radical new step being taken by Samsung as part of the company's massive recall of those Galaxy Note 7 phones. Now, Samsung's already recalled the phones after reports that some caught fire. Some, however, holding on to those phones. So Samsung is now planning a software update that will make the remaining Note 7 phones inoperable. And ABC's Gloria Riviera has details for us this morning. Hi, Gloria. Hi there, Paula. Good morning. It has been a long and costly road for Samsung, and it is not over yet. The tech giant now appearing to throw a Hail Mary, rolling out an update December 19th to make sure every last phone that could possibly pose a threat is disabled. After months of phones on fire, Samsung is rolling out a virtual kill switch that will shut down the last remaining Note 7s sold in the U.S. The over-the-air update already agreed to by three of the country's biggest wireless providers will prevent the Note 7 from charging at all and will eliminate their ability to work as mobile devices. This is Samsung's last-ditch effort to get these phones out of people's hands. Samsung hoping this extreme step will be the final one in a long string of headaches and safety crises. Shortly after the company's newest flagship device launched in late summer, reports emerged of devices smoking, cracking, and even bursting into flames, reportedly setting off fires in customers' pockets, homes, and cars. I saw small red bursts, um, and then it started to smoke, sizzle, and burn on the nightstand. Even after the South Korean smartphone giant initiated its own worldwide effort to refund and replace the faulty phones, some of those new devices, too, were tied to spontaneous fires. 93% of all recalled Note 7s sold in the U.S. have been returned. But according to Samsung, U.S. customers are still hanging on to more than 130,000 of those phones. People do need to return these phones. They've been recalled. They're dangerous. Samsung is still offering replacement devices when Note 7s are turned in, but at least one major car carrier, Verizon, is pushing back, refusing the update, saying it does not want to leave users who don't yet have a replacement without a in an emergency situation, especially, Verizon says, during the busy holiday season. Dan, Paula. All right, Gloria, but Samsung clearly trying to take matters back in their own hands. Thank you for that report this morning. We do have some more serious weather to tell you about in other parts of the country, so let's go back to Rob Marciano. Hi, Rob. Hi, Paula. We often talk about when the cold air is in place, it's just a matter of time <clears throat> before some moisture gets into it. And that's what we're already seeing. That Pacific storm that brought the freezing rain and snow to the Pacific Northwest now making inroads to the plains. And we've got snow that's developing across Nebraska. And this low will be traversing the Great Lakes here in the next 36 hours. Snow in Chicago, Milwaukee, Green Bay during the day tomorrow. Grand Rapids, Detroit. This is not lake effect. Buffalo, you'll get a piece of this as well. By the time it gets to the Northeast, some a warmer air will get into the I-95 corridor, so any snow will change over to rain. But the northern uh, New York and northern New England will see some snow. Could see four, five, six inches of it, especially uh, north of Interstate 90. Uh, so be aware of that. Some uh, another system moving into the into the west as well, raising the snow levels for the Sierras and warm across the south. That's a quick check on what's going on nationally. Here now is your local forecast. Hopefully you can stay under the covers a little bit longer this morning. Here's a look of where we're coming in right now. As far as the wind is taking into account these values here, 25 degrees in D.C., 19 in Winchester and also in Hagerstown. So we're off to quite a cold start. Daytime high today, upper 30s with lots of sunshine if you're trying to get that Christmas tree or hang the holiday lights. Feeling a little bit warmer on Sunday. Temperatures back in the 40s. However, we will be watching an increase in cloud cover with some wet weather arriving on Monday. It is a beautiful, albeit brisk morning here in Central Park. And if uh, you wouldn't mind, Dan and Paula, I'm going to slide back inside for the next half hour. We'll you know, that. I asked Paula. She said, actually, you do have to stay outside for the rest of the show. No, I didn't. Sorry. No, it was actually Dan that Luckily, told you you had to Paula's be out there the to boss. begin with.
No, <laughs> it was all Dan's fault to begin with that, that sent you out there in the cold. If you, it was up to me, you'd be right here, Rob. We'll settle this in the commercial break. We'll <laughs> see you soon, Rob. Uh, there is a lot of other news this morning, and for that, as always, we kick it over to Mr. Ron Claiborne. Good morning, sir. Good, by, by the way, I think you should stay out there for authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back uh, tomorrow, Rob. Easy, Rob. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin with breaking news overnight. The U.S. Senate averting a government shutdown by passing a spending bill less than an hour before a midnight deadline. President Obama promptly signing that bill.